pause to me now then to introduce our, our two speakers. So our first speaker, Dr. Kendra uh, Dupi, has a PhD in political science and she's a political economist researching education in conflict and crisis. She currently works on research studies about accelerated education for refugees in northern Uganda education provision, for Rohingya refugees in um, Bangladesh, and financing of education in emergencies. Our second speaker, Max Breeder, is co-founder and co-director of the international community-based public arts organisation, Art Illusion. His work focuses on cultivating ongoing programmes by educating local artists globally on how to transform communities through public engagement, creative facilitation, and inspired participation as the next phase in the history of the arts. Max's projects have taken him from Syrian, South Sudanese, uh, Palestinian, and Greek refugee camps to conflict zones, traumatized communities, and across borders to over 26 countries globally. He's received recognition from the New York Times, CBS, and the Associated Press. He was awarded the International Crisis Award from World of Children and UNICEF in 2018. He will join me in welcoming him. Okay, ladies first, I guess. Uh, <laughs> right, so my name is Kendra, um, and I'm going to give a very academic presentation which I, I'm really glad that I'm, uh, it's not only going to be about academics today because that would be very boring, especially in a field like education um, in conflict and crisis. So um, hopefully Max will then, uh, and Liz will come up with something a little bit more practical. So what I'm going to do is talk about the existing evidence base, um, or what we know, or think we know, about the relationships between education and armed conflicts and education and peace. Are there relationships there in the sense does uh, education impact on those uh, two outcomes? And if so, what kind of relationship is there? What's the nature of the impacts? Um, and say a little bit more about when, why, and how education might impact armed conflict and or peace. And then I want to conclude, um, because this is the real answer, about uh, what type of research we need more of on this topic. And um, so what I'm gonna really talk about, <clears throat> and you can read it afterwards if you're so inspired, is some colleagues of mine um, and I at the research institute I work at in Norway called uh, the Peace Research Institute Oslo. We collaborated on a systematic review of quantitative or statistical studies about education and armed conflict, education and peace. And we also contributed to a World Bank study that's been published recently called Pathways to Peace. And it's about the role of inequalities in armed conflicts and alternatively in how to address inequalities um, so that we can reduce armed conflicts. Let me just say a word about my institution. Um, so the Peace Research Institute Oslo is quite well known for uh, yearly statistics on armed conflicts. And we have now started up a quite large uh, program on education in emergencies or crisis or conflict situations. So we have several ongoing projects about education for refugees in Uganda, uh, Syria, Somalia, and uh, Bangladesh. And so I just want to clarify on some terms. So when I talk about education and the kind of studies that we reviewed, we looked at, and this is where a lot of the literature is right now, the quantitative literature, is really formal Western schooling. And so I'll come back to this, but this leaves a large research gap about other types of education and the role of those other types of education in either the outbreak of conflict or peace. And when I say armed conflict, uh, we mean political violence. So this is large-scale organized violence with political aims. A little bit more specifically, we mean violence and armed <coughs> clashes between identifiable groups <coughs> in society. Often these clashes are about access to power and resources, hence why we call it political. 
And often, but not always, these <coughs> clashes involve the governments. So traditionally, we would call this civil war or interstate war. Um, but we also looked at studies um, that uh, covered genocide, terrorism, uh, intercommunal violence. This is when, for instance, ethnic or other types of groups are uh, fighting each other, but the, the government may not be involved. And also urban violence, things like riots, protests, and crime. And then finally, what do I mean when I say peace? So in, unfortunately, in the quantitative literature and the quantitative study of conflict, this just means the absence of war. And that's also really unsatisfying, that we don't have very good measures of what we mean by peace. And that's something I'll come back to in the end that we need to do more work on. It's understanding what it is we're working towards when we talk about education having an influence on peace. Now, if you're familiar with Johan Galtung, which some of you may be, he started my institute. He has two conceptions of peace, negative and positive peace. Uh, negative peace being the absence of war, and positive peace entailing things like social justice. So there are other conceptions out there, and there are scholars working towards trying to understand what is peace and how do we measure it. But the literature on education, the quantitative literature, hasn't engaged with those concepts yet. OK, so in terms of these, whether there are relationships between education, conflict, and peace, so first of all, there are a lot of assumptions that education positively impacts peace and reduces conflict. This is the, what we call the conventional wisdom, uh, particularly uh, amongst uh, advocacy organizations. There's a lot of faith that education is the key to peace. Um, all the way back to Aristotle, uh, there is this idea that education can promote peace. And famously, in the 1946 UNESCO Constitution, uh, is the opening quote, since the wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And recently, if you know who Steven Pinker is, he's written this book called The Better Angels uh, of Our Nature about uh, why we have seen a reduction in violence and conflict over many hundreds of years. And education, he says, plays a key role in this. And he says that this is for four different reasons. That through literacy, human beings learn how to be more empathetic uh, and to identify with the sufferings of other people. That education gave people more critical thinking skills and we could apply reason to human affairs. Um, that it is also a government, when government provides education, this is a signal to the population that it cares and the population may be less willing then to take up arms. And finally, that education can give people skills for jobs and occupy their time. And I'll come back to these things because I think they're not, they're quite controversial, some of them, and they're not maybe as straightforward as we think. So ultimately, the question is, is it truly the case that education could cause conflict or can cause peace? Uh, so what is the evidence base? Um, so again, we looked at statistical or quantitative studies on this question. Um, we were able to collect 42 different studies published between 1990 and 2016. So it neglects some older literature, but we pretty much captured what we could in the more, um, let's call it modern era. And these studies looked at um, evidence across states, they looked at evidence within states, and then they looked at um, individual level studies, so opinion uh, surveys. And then again, I'll draw a little bit on, at the end here, on this study that we did for the World Bank. So I'll give you the answer now. What do we find? We, in fact, find that um, the evidence suggests the consensus that education does generally have what is called a pacifying effect, that education does reduce the risk that uh, a state or community will experience violent conflict. This is in fact probably true. Um, but we also know um, that there are higher education levels amongst those who perpetrate terrorism and genocide. So this is a challenge to um, this finding. And finally we conclude, I think necessarily so, that 
um, any relationship we think we observe between education and conflict and peace is really complex. It's multidimensional. It depends a lot on the type of political violence, mediating factors, and levels of analysis. In other words, human beings are really complicated and messy, and societies are too, right? So it's, it would be rare, I think, if we're very unusual to say, just add more education and everything will be fine, right? It depends a lot on the local context, as it should, right? Okay, and finally, my real conclusion is that we need more research. And I'm in the right place, I think, so. Uh, now you all, I'll give you a menu of options and we can expect some nice theses out in a few years. Okay, just briefly, what are some theories about why education could either lead to more conflict or alternatively, more peace? So in the literature we reviewed, there are a few different theories. One is what we call grievances. So if you exclude people from being able to access education, this makes people upset and willing to go and use violence. There's an alternative theory here that expanding an education system too quickly can also make people upset when there's not enough job opportunities afterwards. Second is um, what we call an opportunity cost argument, and I'll come back to this and explain this more. And finally, um, arguments or theories about the role of education content, socialization, and the transmission of norms. So let me just tell you a little bit more about these, um, just in a little bit more detail. So in terms of grievances, so the um, existing theories suggest that um, when uh, people are excluded from education entirely, or they are provided only very poor quality education, and of course we can talk about what is, the, what is quality, um, or they are not able to use their education. These may lead people to uh, be very upset, particularly with the state, which is supposed to provide education, and thus take up, uh, or choose to use violence. And this largely comes from a larger theory within conflict uh, research called relative deprivation theory. And all this says is that when my expectations about what I think I should have are not met, I am willing to use violence. And groups can mobilize people around this. Now I think this is a very heroic assumption that um, and there are lots of other things that need to be in place for this to happen. Um, but we do have a lot of evidence that, for instance, group inequalities, uh, narratives around that can mobilize people for violence. Um, some other theories about the role of grievances involve um, this earlier thing that I mentioned about governments signaling to the population that it cares by providing education, um, that government can reach out to people through education systems and build nations and that this will then make people more or less likely to take up arms against government. And finally, there are old theories, and we still <coughs> hear them and see them, that education spurs economic development, and we know that we see less armed conflict in places that are richer, generally. Um, of course, there are some exceptions, like the United <coughs> States. Um, but in general, economic development and democracy tend to reduce um, armed conflict. Okay, arguments about opportunity <coughs> costs. So these largely come from economists, no surprise there. And these arguments say that um, people who are educated have a higher opportunity cost for going to war. Basically, if I have more education, um, my labor is more expensive in a sense. I can go out and find other things to do and that I can get um, wages that are higher than me being in a rebel group. Um, and this is, should especially be true for young men, who are unfortunately the bulk of participants in armed conflict. Um, and again, just more highly, the theory is more highly educated individuals just have more options in life. And so joining a rebel group or a violent group isn't your only option. And there is this old theory about schooling pe keeping people busy, that at the end of the day, we keep young people uh, disciplined and in a place where we can monitor them and keep them out of, and this, we see this in the criminology literature too. It keeps people busy. 
and not out making trouble. And again, rapidly expanding education can also mean that uh, people may be uh, upset over this and choose to use violence. Okay, finally, there are theories about content of education, socialization, and norms. So an old social science theory, modernization theory, says that education really shapes attitudes and preferences and people's opinions and your beliefs, um, the way that you think that people should relate to each other in society, gives you more critical thinking, it at the end of the day makes you less likely to be willing to accept to use violence. Um, there are other theories that look at how different groups in society are treated in the curriculum um, by school officials, including teachers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are theories about socialization. So if you're familiar with literature on the hidden curriculum, so how the kinds of lessons we implicitly teach uh, young people about learning to work together, about conflict resolution, um, and so forth. And finally, schools do transmit norms, um, for instance, around the acceptability of violence to resolve conflicts or to channel your grievances through institutions by going out and voting or politically uh, participating politically. Okay, so what did we find? So I've already given you the answer, but let me tell you in a little bit more detail what we found across all of these 42 studies. So there is consensus that education does make it less likely for a community or a state to experience violent armed conflicts. And it seems that the more uh, schooling that is achieved, the less likely that we should see violent armed conflicts, especially when we have more secondary education. Um, there are some theories that expanding university education or tertiary education could be risky particularly when it doesn't translate into jobs. But um, it doesn't seem that this is the case on, on balance when we look across studies. But there have not been many cases or many studies on this particular question. So it is pretty clear that unequal distribution of education access across groups in society, for instance, groups um, that we could say are based on ethnicity or region or um, perhaps religion, does make it more likely to see violent armed conflict. And like I mentioned before, the perpetrators of genocide and terrorism are on average more highly educated. It is not clear how education content matters in this uh, relationship, at least from a quantitative standpoint, um, whether or how education content, what is actually taught, how that matters for a conflict or for peace. Um, so, are there studies on how education could or has contributed to peace building? And this was the question we took up in our World Bank study, um, specifically this on uh, specific education programs and interventions, <coughs> policy interventions, and their impact on peace. And by peace, again, here I mean really the absence of war. There is very little evidence. Very few uh, studies have been conducted about, the spe about specific types of education policies, reforms, and programs on peace. So this is kind of strange because a lot of peacemakers really have education on their agenda. Um, some research I did some years ago, uh, I looked at all peace agreements that had been signed since 1990, and we know that education is very frequently mentioned in peace agreements. Over half of all peace agreements mention the need to provide education. We also know that refugees are often granted the right um, to access education in exile, and that uh, education is a priority for many humanitarian organizations uh, in conflict. Um, and in fact, last year was uh, a peak in terms of spending of humanitarian aid on education, so more money uh, than the last almost 10 years is being spent on education uh, in emergencies. So it's, it's a priority for peacemakers, um, yet we have little understanding about um, the types of interventions that we should put in place. Um, we do think, uh, it seems pretty clear that increasing access to education after conflict seems likely to reduce um, the, uh, that, the likelihood that you'll see armed conflict again. 
Um, but like I said, we know little about specific types of programs. Okay, so here's my menu of options, so I can send you all out on a, an academic mission. What's my wish list of things? So I think that was maybe the most useful thing out of this exercise, was really to know what we don't know, um, which is exciting. Then we have a research agenda for the field going forward. And I think on the top of my list is looking more at the qualitative research. There's a huge body of really great, interesting qualitative research on education and conflict and peace, and we need to have a better overview of that. And how does it speak to or interact with or complement the quantitative research? We need to know more about how context matters. We need to know about is it only education that matters for peace or conflict, or does education need to work with other things in order to have an effect? Um, we also have to think about the fact that conflict impacts education. So we must think about timing. That um, when a conflict hits, it reduces the ability of people to go to school, which can then make them also upset and want to uh, or need to contribute to conflict. Like I mentioned at the beginning, we need more research on other forms of education than just formal, traditional Western schooling. We need to look at for instance, art programs, or life skills, or vocational and technical training, non-formal education, this is really missing. We need to think a lot more about educational quality. Is it enough that we just put bodies in classrooms? Probably not. Um, if you have ever been to a uh, classroom in a non, let's call it non-Western, in a classroom in the Global South, particularly conflict-affected places, <coughs> and you see 200 children in a classroom and no books, and no teachers, and no desks, it's hard to imagine how that's going to contribute to peace building. So we need a lot more research on educational quality, what's being taught, and the schooling experience. If children are beaten or abused at school, it's also hard to imagine how that can translate into peace. Um, and then thinking more about yeah, the policy. What is the policy implication? What should we do? If we think more education is important, do we just put children in classrooms? Or if the content is important, maybe it's more important to put money into revising curriculum. Uh, and then my final plea, more evidence on the role of education in building and sustaining peace, including defining what we mean by peace and how do we get there. That's it. Thanks a lot. Hello everybody, how are you doing? Okay, great. Um, so my name is Max, uh, and I am the co-founder and co-executive director of Art Artolution, this crazy word. And um, Art Artolution is more of an idea than, than, than just an organization. Yeah. And it's the idea of what could the next evolution in the history of education and emergencies look like? What is the role of the arts and creativity for people who've been through serious trauma? And what can this mean for the future of responses? And responses from the, the many different institutions and many different perspectives that have a stake to play in, in conflict around the world. So what I want to do is I want to walk through a little bit of different ways that the arts can be utilized in different contexts and different ideas and then kind of come to, to the model that we've really built uh, around the world. So Artolution is an international organization that I, I co-founded and co-direct, and we paint murals, we build interactive sculptures out of trash and recycled objects, we do performance, puppetry, all as a form of interactive storytelling, of having children, youth, and communities telling their stories and discussing issues that are important in their lives as psychosocial support and social and emotional learning, and being able to do this on an ongoing and sustainable basis. So, so I want to first do a little bit of a survey of some of the work that we do, and then really focus on three case studies, three specific examples. So this is work that we do in India, and we were working in a place called Okla, the largest slum community in Delhi, really discussing domestic violence, where we said, what are the most important issues in your lives? And these girls were talking ongoing about the importance of boys and girls being treated equally. So we discussed with them, how do you want to show this? And they said, we want to do a performance. And we wanted to be able to put it in our language, in our language through our bodies, through our minds, through our voices. Yeah. 
So it's very important to contextualize this within the modalities that can speak to the cultures that need to tell themselves that there needs to be a shift. And, and very important is we always work with local artists. Her name is Rizvi, and she was one of the performers we worked with who it's so important for them to be able to facilitate this work. And this was actually a mural that we painted, which was also about sex trafficking. And, and we used, and we were uh, uh, utilizing and working with and hearing the stories of women who've been through these traumas and having them tell their stories through participating into a public mural. I want to quickly go to Lebanon where we did this program. So I'm gonna quickly survey, uh, we work in 30 countries around the world, but we really focus in eight different regions specifically. So I wanna do a quick survey of, of quite a few countries and then focus on three. In Lebanon, we were, we were working in a place called Uzay, which is in Beirut, in an area that's controlled by Hezbollah. And when we started to talk about what, what would be important issues that you wanna discuss, the women, the, the, a group of women came over and said, you know, we're sewing. And sewing has always been kind of viewed as this kind of something that's pushed to the side. But we think that it's something that's really important to show our culture and to say that, 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 that we are leading the future of how to build our communities. And, and this was working both with Syrian communities and with host Lebanese communities. That, and when we talk about education and emergencies, that single issue of working with host communities and refugee communities is probably one of the most major components to how, an ever, how peace can exist within the, the massive influx that we're seeing in a lot of the developing world. And, and so, so being able to use unconventional materials like trash and being able to incorporate sustainability and the environment, I think, is critical when we also look at global warming and its impacts on global migration. Yeah. Um, we work a lot with UNICEF, with IOM, UNHCR, with different UN agencies and international organizations. And the emphasis on being able to utilize materials that already exist in locations, I think, is critical to not forcing a reliance on international aid, but rather being able to have things that are already in existence, like this kind of trash, collected and then turned into something like a giant creature. And this creature is there to be able to tell a story, and if you see, we actually attach drumsticks with cable, where the children are able to write songs, be able to do performances, all relating to important local issues. This exact moment, I remember, they were actually singing a song about the importance of children going to school rather than child labor, which is a very common issue within this region. I want to quickly talk about this. This is right outside of Mexico City. And this was a quick, this was a program that we did, which I think really illuminates a very important story. So in this story, we, I was working with a rainwater harvesting NGO to talk about the importance of clean water, washing your hands, being able to utilize water in a healthy and an effective way. So we're there, we're talking about it, we have a whole curriculum, all the kids are learning about washing their hands. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the day, three mothers come up to me. And they say, you know, in all due respect, you know, we respect what you're talking about with water, but those are not the most important issues in our lives. The most important issue in our life is domestic violence and alcoholism. Can you change your curriculum to discuss alcoholism and domestic violence? And he said, of course. So we overnight, we completely changed our curriculum, and it completely became about the relationships between boys and girls, between families, and not saying we are talking about domestic violence, but rather saying we're talking about healthy relationships. Yeah. And it's very important the way that this is discussed. I think that story is important just to be able to illuminate what it means to be able to really contextualize education in alternative modalities. This is work we did in South Africa, um, working uh, specifically working in an orphanage where there's a big emphasis, and this is important I think in education across the globe as behavioral ideation of the future. How can you conceive that you can have a future and what does your future look like? And you can see here they said, this is my dream. My dream is for all peace. That's disgusting. And you can see this can come through, through images that are much more recognizable, and others might be images that are allegorical, like animals, which I think is an important component to think about how you can teach ethics, morals, learning through, through locally contextualized images and ways that, that really matter both to children and to families. So this is a finished mural that we created in South Africa. And if you look up close, you see my dream is to have a real family. And this is for a child whose parents had died of the AIDS epidemic. 
uh, all of a sudden we're transported to the Dominican Republic where we do programs on the border of Haiti. And here it's the largest trash dump in uh, an area called Santiago. And what we did is we, we specifically focused on discussing uh, the importance of reflecting on the Taino culture, which is the indigenous culture here. And they said, we want to build a giant boat out of trash. And this boat needs to represent the celebrations of our culture that are disappearing, that are dying. And this is the, the, the festivals of Carnival that reference the Taino culture. So I'm, I'm wanting to use all of these different examples for you to be able to see that, that education can come in many different forms, I believe. And a transdisciplinary approach to being able to learn lessons, for example, this was all about bacteria. So you see this bacteria creature. Right? And we'd go and perform, rah, rah, all right? performing to get kids involved. And this was during the Zika virus outbreak in Brazil. Yeah? And we were talking about the importance of understanding about bacteria, understanding about what happens if you don't wash your hands. Then we took learning about these ideas about cells and bacteria and painted them on this giant human creature that we created here, where you can see all of the children painted their ideas about what it means that the bacteria that lives in our body, that we have good bacteria and that we have bacteria that can hurt us. So being able to use something where these kids who do not have access to a, to a safe environment, where there's severe gun violence on a daily basis in these favelas, to be able to have ways of discussing what they're going through, both from, from a perspective of biology here, but also from a perspective of unexpected ways of getting people engaged, of public engagement. I want to move here to Europe, where we are right now. Uh, if anybody is, uh, might or may not know where this is, this is the Calais jungle. Yeah. I worked in the Calais refugee camp for about three, three weeks, um, predominantly with South Sudanese and Afghani populations. And what was fascinating about working here is we did all of these murals, people who only speak Pashtun and Dari, who only speak Sudanese Arabic, yeah? and, they, and they had no way to talk, they had no reason to interact with each other. So being able to find a reason to cross those barriers that might initially be conflict-based, but instead have a reason that we need to communicate. This is an amazing man named Rashid who came from the Nuba Mountains in Sudan, and he walked from Sudan to France. Uh, I've been captured in Libya where he, was, where he was locked for a year in a slave camp. Yeah, these stories that are unbelievable. And one of the things that they said is, we want to show something of strength, that we are resilient, we are here. And so they decided to show a gorilla as, as a symbol of strength. And this is something that I think is really important, is, is, is that I left. Two weeks later, the whole camp was, was destroyed, and all of our murals were burned. Yeah? Five of our murals got burned and, and destroyed. And so I'm thinking to myself, what was the point of this? Right? We did this huge activity with all these kids, with all these people. What was the point of this? And this comes back down to the value of education. It was the relationships. It was the connections. It was the conversations. And when we think about the value of education in emergency settings, we can't only look at the, the product. We also have to look at the process. And I think that's a very important lesson to consider. Yeah. Here, this is in the Greek refugee camps on the border of Turkey, being able to use music as a therapeutic methodology to have children I have ideas about what their futures could look like. And, and there's a great story that I really want to tell that I think can illuminate why we do research, why research matters. So, so this was a found instrument, sound instrument creature that we created. And, and, and this is, I think, a really important story. This was on the top of a hill in the Samos refugee camp. And, and a boat comes up in the Mediterranean, and it was about 100 people from Afghanistan. And they're all coming up, all huddled with their blankets right, that had just been given by the, the aid organizations. And this man comes up, and he sees all these children banging on this goofy-looking creature that they built out of trash. And he comes up to me, and he grabs me, and he hugs me, and he starts kissing me. And then and all of a sudden, he drops to his knees, and he says, this is not what I thought a refugee camp would look like. This is what freedom looks like. And I think that idea, this is what freedom looks like. It's very hard to quantitatively and quali qualitatively define freedom. But in somebody's mind, when they see that there are ways of being able to engage people beyond what they expected, that, I think, is, is an opening into a world that's important to look at. Yeah. This is one of the last examples I'll give before I go into my three case studies. This is in no man's land between Palestine and Israel. Um, this, is, this is specifically working, uh, working both with Palestinian and Israeli youth together, which is a very controversial thing that we do. Um, and within these programs, you can see so much of it is about dialogue, 
about what are ways that we can have dialogue if we've both been through severe trauma, inflicted by one another, and what does it mean to try to tell stories that can relate to people who've been through serious trauma on, on two different sides of a single issue. Yeah? Being able to discuss here, was, this was in the US consulate in Jerusalem, uh, the, uni the, the, the unity of monotheism in spite of the conflict and the three monotheistic religions, even though you can't tell which is which, the idea is that we are all connected, that we are all the same. You see this beautiful woman, I love this woman. Yeah? Now, you would never expect it, but she had a lot of her family killed and her children killed in the conflict in the first and the second antifada. We worked with an organization called the Parent Circle Families Forum, and I think this is an important element to consider about peace education that specifically works with parents who've had their children killed in a conflict in Israel and Palestine. We did a mural where we actually got these women to come and tell their stories through painting uh, in Palestine, in Inshallah, when we rolled up this canvas and brought it to Israel and had Israeli parents who had their children killed paint on the same canvas. This one single canvas, we were then able to get a permit to be able to get uh, 100 Palestinians to come into Tel Aviv to actually have a dialogue with these bereaved Israeli families as well and have a conflict about their mutual loss and create this mural, which was displayed at the United Nations building. People said this wasn't possible. People were telling me this isn't possible that you, that you can do this. But this is possible, and I think it's an example of the steps that many times political processes cannot facilitate but that interpersonal dialogue can, and interpersonal relationships as models of what is actually possible when you start to have these kinds of conversations. And then when you look at the stories and the imagery as representations of what the ideas and the values are. Yeah. So here, for example, you can see that this story is all about the past and the pain of the past, the shattering of, uh, of expectations and ideas that we may have with one another, the looking to the, towards the present and towards the future with birds flying out of one's head. So, and, and this is the last image for, for, the, for this section, which is specifically talking about uh, that people said that uh, this is impossible and that we should have showed this image, that people shouldn't see this, yeah? and that we can't show it on, on the internet. And so, but this was a moment that did happen. Yeah. This is a moment that, that was created because the arts were something that were there that although there's no reason to interact, it gave a reason, which I think is really important to consider. Okay. So this is the first case. Yeah. This is specifically working in the Syrian refugee camps uh, in Jordan, in Azraf refugee camp. You can see it's a very, very difficult environment. Now, the reason I want to start with this case is that what we do is we train vocal artists how to facilitate their own programs, how to facilitate dialogues with communities, and how to be able to take those stories and transfer them onto walls to tell stories about family, about home, and about the future. So when you look across this, you start to see that some of these people, it's the worst times of their lives, and yet you are seeing them at their best. And I think that's something that education at its best can do, is this idea that education can bring out the best in people. No matter the trauma they've been through, no matter the horrors that they have seen, of having lost a whole family, or having uh, experienced things that no child should ever have to see, for them to be able to tell those stories and be able to talk about, about being a mother and a child and pay homage to a mother, or about being able to look at what traditional pattern making might look like, it gives a reason to discuss issues of culture. What do you want to say to the world? How do you want to represent who you are? And how do we learn through this process of asking and curiosity? And I think this is a great example of a story that represents education. Here, this was a girl who said, one day I want to be a city engineer, a city planner, and I want to go back to Syria and I want to rebuild my country. Yeah? That country that I want to rebuild, I want to have a map of what it's going to look like. And what was amazing is we ended up having this abandoned car, working with the Norwegian Refugee Council, collected this trash and we took this car, and you can see here we ended up attaching all of these objects to it. Yeah? And these are the local artists that we were training in that environment. And these, these creatures that we created, it's kind of funny, goofy, silly creatures, yet that way of, of really having fun what actually allowed us to discuss really difficult issues like child labor, where we talked about that with the kids, and that through this process, even though it, it has this guise of being fun, it actually has very deep therapeutic practices embedded within it, which I think is very important to consider when you're looking at it. And when you're looking at all these images, when you're looking at all of these kids, it's so important to know that she learned about the Aboriginal communities we work with. That all the kids we work with see all of these other images of kids from around the world that combat social isolation. 
Many times people feel like they're completely alone, that people don't care about them, and that people don't know what's happened to them. But for them to know that they have an opportunity to connect to others around the world, and that what they do and what they say matters, it, it changes the context of how education can function. Because then there's a reason to be educated. There's a reason that I want an education, because it gives me an opportunity to make a better life for the future, which I think is an important consideration. And this was another program we did in a host community about this idea of being able to have tea and a welcoming gesture from the Jordanian and Palestinian community to the incoming Syrian communities in Jordan. And these are the three artists, Samir, Muhammad Ibrahim, and Ishmael, who have continued our programs on an ongoing basis. And one of the things that he said, that they told me, and I think individual stories are very important to illuminate why this work is important. He came up to me and said, what's the hardest question you've ever been asked in your life before? I said, I don't know, Muhammad Ibrahim. Uh, how about for you? He said, when my five-year-old son asked me, why are people trying to kill us? And he said, and he said I answered him and said, I don't know, but we don't hate anybody. And he said, I know what it's like to see my child, children starving and not to be able to give them food. But every day is better than the last. I said, what makes you say that? He said, because we are still alive. And, and not only are we alive, but I am alive to tell my story. And that story, when you start thinking about how can that be translated into thinking about educational ways of finding healthy ways to tell those stories rather than to perpetuate more violence, that's a very important question. This is the largest refugee camp in the world, called Balukali. This is the second case I want to use. And this is specifically, it's actually the largest refugee camp in history, with over a million people currently in Myanmar, uh, that have come from Myanmar on the border of uh, uh, Bangladesh. And this is an example where you see that it's hor really horrifying conditions when you spend a lot of time there. I've been in Bangladesh four times within the last year. And what's amazing is when you put it here, children are not allowed to get an education. Formal education is not allowed by the Bangladeshi government. So instead, you have these very informal learning environments. And, and when you provide something like an opportunity to paint, hundreds of children come from the entire region. And they say, you know, this is an opportunity to do something special. Oh my god, I can't believe you're here. And so when we would do these painting processes, we, I decided we have to do something special here, something different than we've done before. So we collected a fabric that had been thrown away. And, and when you look at this fabric, you can see that it actually came to represent something really important, which is this idea of having an imagination, an imagination beyond what they may have thought possible. And when you look at the stories, for example, this is a story that I think illuminates a lot of what we're discussing. And this story is specifically about elephants. And it said, what if we show elephants carrying a home on their back, walking over the Naf River, and being welcomed by the rooster representing the Bengali community? These kinds of narratives, I think, are critical to understanding what it means to be able to use education in formal environments. Now, what I really want to leave everybody with before we go into our dialogue here uh, is, that, is that it's so important not just to consider education in the formal way that many of us consider, but rather to realize that the potential of education is that a community can be an educator. That community as an educator can reshape the potential of what it means. And, and one of the most important elements of the work that we do is being able to have these stories, they, they continue to live on. And that, and that when you look at many of these images, is that the most important people to consider are the artists and the educators who we are training, who continue these programs. And that in these specific environments, how do you measure the impact of the work that they're doing? How do you know that they're being successful and that these artists are continuing to make a difference in the lives of these kids? And, and, there's, and there's one final story I want to leave you with. And I think this story can, can exemplify how you know that a difference can be made. I, I walk into this specific school in Kutupalong, and this is a Bengali school. And for the first time in the history of the Rohingya people, we were able to get a permit to be able to bring a group of Rohingya children out of the camp into the Bengali school. And we're all sitting around, and we're doing name games, and we're having this big conversation. And all of a sudden, this one, and I said, what is the mural going to be about? And one little boy in the back raises his hand, and he starts talking. He's talking, he's talking, he's fervently talking. And, and my translator isn't translating. And he, and he goes like this, just wait. And I'm like, oh, and I'm like, okay. And five minutes, six minutes, 10 minutes of this, of, the, of this boy talking, I look around, and all of our artists are crying. And, our, and, and, and the children are also crying. And, and it was this complete silence. And I had no idea what the, this boy was saying. 
And all of a sudden, he, he finishes, and, and the translator comes over to me and he says, Max, just brace yourself for what I'm gonna say. This little boy says hello, he said this. He said, hello, my name is Shumo, and I'm eight years old. I am Bengali, and I am a Buddhist. And I know what these people had to go through in Myanmar. And I take accountability for the genocide that they went through. Yeah. It's an eight-year-old boy saying this. He said, they've come into our country, and as humans, it is our job to treat them as our brothers and sisters. It is our job to treat them as humans. Yeah. And, and the ending of it is, is I asked these artists, what, how did this make you feel? And they said, we've never been told this. We had most of our families killed, and, we, and we've seen horrific things. Yet this one seven-year-old boy was able to teach us what we've always dreamed of hearing. And the ending image they came up with was the idea of a Rohingya girl and a Bengali boy sharing one idea, sharing one concept, and that idea is that they can share. And so when I think, we, when I think we're considering this idea of education and emergencies, the idea that creativity is one of the most untapped potentials to be able to teach lessons about important issues within communities, I, I truly believe is one of the most important potentials for being able to change the history of the arts and change the history of education emergencies. Thank you.